So like I think from my mom's side that entrepreneurial spirit's really there. My mom, she's she's an amazing and very interesting woman. Like she still has a passion right now to make drag queen panties. Like she really is going to, I'm not even joking. She randomly called me one day and was like, I need to tell you something. I really think there's a market to make underwear for, you know, the drag queens. And I'm like, yes, mom, okay. there actually is a market yeah. for that. I'm like, in fact, I know about 2000 drag queens we can talk to to start market <laughs> testing this. And she's like, you know, she's just one of those people who's from an ideation standpoint. I think she, she's blessed in some general ignorance about the boundaries of what is and, and not what isn't isn't possible and i think i got a lot of that from her asha was born to a korean mother and a palestinian israeli father who moved to the states in the early 1970s asha was born and raised in baltimore maryland where her parents owned and operated a carryout in the city at 17 years old, she moved to D.C. to attend college studying international affairs. While at college, she would work four restaurant jobs plus school full-time, and if she wasn't doing that, she was working two or three jobs with a work-study program and worked semi-full-time with the government. In 2014, Asha created a product that would please the market but would also align with her beliefs and her roots. Her goal was to clean up American cuisine and make it available to every household. She started with a Kickstarter that broke land speed records and an application to have a booth at Union Market. When they turned down her application, she organized a pop-up at Dolceza across the street and produced a line around the block and a whole lot of attention. The next week, the offer letter from Union Market hit her inbox and she was off to the races. Less than three months into the biscuit booth, she was secret shopped by Whole Foods and that's when the rock really started to roll. In March of 2015, Whole Foods started bringing her into their stores. After a few short months, they pulled an unprecedented move and had her demo her biscuits the day before Thanksgiving. In true form, Asha showed up with her own table and fucking crushed it. She brought 150 biscuits and sold every single one of them within three hours. From there, the business grew from having just a few hundred stores on the roster to landing a contract with Kroger and Publix, boosting that number to over a thousand stores. Asha maintained a full-time job throughout the entire startup process until they opened the brick and mortar of April of 2017. Talk about relentless. Today, Mason Dixie Biscuits is the fastest growing regional brand to launch in the Whole Foods mid-Atlantic history, and you can buy them anywhere you can possibly imagine, even on QVC. It's the number five biscuit brand in the entire country and number one in my belly. In fact, it's the only biscuit brand that uses real butter. Only three years from inception, she is now in 3,000 stores, and there is no stopping her anytime soon. So, ladies and gentlemen, please, it is my pleasure to introduce the one and only Asha Abalasha. How's what? it going, Molly? I, you know, I love you, man. I am so excited Same, to girl. be here with you. Same. It's been a long time. You know, and I've always known you were a badass because you're just, you're just a badass. You just have that whole <laughs> vibe. Like, you, you don't take shit from anybody. And I love that. And then just really digging in on your like whole, you know, story, like the real details. Like, you know, I'm really impressed with how smoothly you. you moved between industries and opportunities. And, you know, I just really want to touch on like, you know, when you first got into school and you wanted to work on international studies and then you just realized like, hey, you know, like I don't I don't have the privilege that it takes for this. Like my parents aren't in this uh economic bracket or in this like you know sphere of uh, reality right exactly and, and and instead of giving up you know instead of you know uh you know instead of giving up you pivoted and you use that to your advantage you know Absolutely. so let, let, let's talk about that you know like what what were you going through when that happened i mean it's a big deal right to go to college and you think you want all this and you get there and you're like fuck exactly i mean it is and you know i'm a first generation american so like you know as a kid you're told especially being half asian you're told you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer and that's it that's it yeah and you know i'm squeamish with blood and i can't tell a lie so i couldn't do either one of those jobs <laughs> So I was like, you know, what am I going to do? You know, go to college, went to UW, great university, was totally inspired by the people around me in the classes I took. Um, and, you know, just there's a there's a DC has that energy, right? Everybody wants to do good. And you got to define what that is. Most definitely. And um, I thought it was going to be, you know, doing international development work, like making better communities in other countries that really 
you know, we're a blessed country. We have a lot of amazing things. If you can live, work, and play in one building, that's pretty fucking amazing. Yeah. Um, and most people don't even have running water in most of the rest of the world. So thinking about what that shift in dynamic was, so that was really exciting to me. And I really wanted to do it. And then you figure out what it takes to do it, right? You think it's just a degree and a resume. And in fact, it's mom and dad can sponsor me for six months at a time to do an unpaid internship. It's a big global development firm. Or you got to know so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Like, I, w- I grew up not knowing a single woman working in business. I had never seen a woman in a business suit. Uh, the most I could ever see a woman aspiring to be is a teacher, right? So, like, to f- be able to know somebody who worked in development, that just didn't happen. Right, um, right. So that's when reality hit, right? Like, I'm like, unless I find some way, some miracle to meet someone's parents who know somebody in this, there's no way I'm going to be able to do it. And if I do, I'm going to be fighting an uphill battle for a long time. So, you know, that's when the pivot happens. Like, you, you, I think when you grow up not having things, you don't take no <laughs> easily. Mm-hmm. It's just not an option. You just have to change, right? You just pivot. And that's when I was like, all right, I'll figure something else out. And, you know, just at the same time, obviously really interested in geography studies. Um, My dad actually is a, he was a sailor. So he's been around the world. Been married on yet. Um, (laughs) But, you know, he's been, you know, he was well-traveled. So I had the benefit of always having global wonder. Right. Um, So that was another way for me maybe to kind of figure things out. And that's when I, you know, said there's nothing wrong with this country and there's, there's nothing wrong with trying to do better in it. And that's kind of how the planning arena kind of launched. And it just got really interesting. It's the study of everything, right? You, right. You know, you need to know about plumbing. You need to know about the environment. You need to know about right. transportation and trees. I mean, you just really figure a lot of stuff out. Yeah. Um, and that was really interesting to me. Um, I think in general, if anyone told me, you know, what interests you, uh, literally, it's everything. I love how everything happens. And later on in life, I figured out it's called systemic thinking. Ah, that's a, that's a real thing. Nice. So um, I guess I am a systemic thinker. And I th- think to be an entrepreneur, you need to be. You have to be. You have to be. Yeah. Um, so that's probably what helped launch me into that that kind of a role. For sure. And, you know, I somehow uh, skipped over this in your bio, but, you know, you also grew up, you know, in the in your parents owned restaurants. Right. So this mm-hmm. was not a. uh a far stretch for you to to dig back into your roots and to food and all of that as well. It wasn't, right? but it was, right? Because, like, your parents go, don't ever work as hard as me, right? Like, mm. they wanted us to go to college so we didn't have to sweat, you know, one day. And, right. my, and my parents owned a carryout, so, like, they didn't own, like, you know, any baller five-star restaurant. I mean, this is, like, in the hood, in the cut, you know, selling chicken gizzards and scrapple. Right. You know, and meanwhile, with, like, a eight millimeter tap you know taped underneath the cash register so it wasn't like it was like some easy thing right so obviously my parents vision of like owning a restaurant is like oh my god you like what are you doing (laughs) what what are you what are you thinking you know like you have an education do something better just the most anti-asian thing you could do is do what your parents did unless they were doctors right so like that was that was a huge moment um but it, it does run through my veins i mean i know my my grandparents owned various businesses even in korea so like i think from my mom's side that entrepreneurial spirit's really there my mom she's she's an amazing and very interesting woman like she still has a passion right now to make drag queen panties like she really is going (laughs) i'm not even joking she randomly called me one day was like i need to tell you something i really think there's a market to make underwear for you know the drag queens and i'm like Yes, mom. There, okay. there actually is a market yeah. for that. I'm like, in fact, I know about 2,000 drag queens we can talk to to start market <laughs> testing this. And she's like, you know, she's just one of those people who's, from an ideation standpoint, I think she she's blessed in some general ignorance about the boundaries of what is and, and not what is and isn't possible. And I think I got a lot of that from her. That's awesome because, you know, I definitely – I have a lot of friends who are sons and daughters of immigrants. And – it almost doesn't even matter which country they came no. from. The pressure is all the same. Exactly. African, Indian, you know, oh. Asian. It's and it is it is real. You right. know, it is real. And so, you know, when you were when you were starting this off, you know, did you get some resistance from your parents? Oh, absolutely. Like every day, my dad be like. You didn't quit your job, though, yet, right? <laughs> and I'm always like, I mean, at the time, I was like, no, nah, I haven't. You know, like, if you were richer, maybe I could. But, you know, <laughs> no, I haven't. I'm still working. 
and I'm still trying to open this business. And um, my mom's always been very supportive, though. She was like, you know, she she I think has always had such a positive, um, just a natural positivity about her that she never really doubts her children. And so I don't think she ever had a doubt in her, her mind that I would do something. Right. I don't know that she ever thought it would be like this. Right. Right. So like that, that I think still to this day, she's kind of figuring it all out. Right. Um, but, you I know, mean, who isn't? But right, who isn't? You know? Right. Like, but she's just, you know, it's just, I mean, just think about, I think about this all the time, the amount of change that people, our parents' generation have gone through. Yeah. It's way bigger than any other generation before it. I mean, they went from like a car was a big deal. Now there's freaking phones that do things for you. I mean, like just ex- get, get on the phone and explain to your parents how to use a computer. I mean, just the, the logistics yeah. of the language of telling somebody how to do something. I mean, and they've gone through all that. So for her to be as progressively minded and supportive as she has been, has been a huge thing for me. Well, you know, I guess like, you know, your mom married outside of her own she background. Did, yeah. So it seems like your mom is a bit of a trailblazer. That's right whole time right yep. you know <laughs> I, I bet you got a little bit of that from her for sure <laughs> so so what about you you know how did you have any moments of you know crippling self-doubt like you know maybe not in the process because I, I don't believe that you have self-doubt when you're on <laughs> when you're in your lane but when you were making these changes yeah. you know to go from like international studies and then you know at such a young age to figure out like nope that's not for me but I ain't stopping and to really blaze your own path in so many different industries with international companies. And then here you are, you know, you know, not everybody makes that leap. You yeah. know, people, you know, you weren't even miserable. You just were like not fulfilled. Right. Yeah, and you were exactly. like, this just isn't for me. And there's no long game here. And so I'm going to pivot. So did you have any moments in your mind? You know, did you have those moments of self-doubt or did you just glaze right? You know, over? I think um, somehow I never got the gene of self-doubt. I've. I'm not I I'd hope I don't ever come off as a cocky person, but I just genuinely don't believe failure is an option. And I think because if you don't ever think it's an option, you just don't run into it. Right. Because right. you just it doesn't exist. Right? right. So I don't think, you know, I don't think I've, I've never really had a negative moment in my mind. Shit gets hard. It absolutely does. But nothing is easy. Nothing nope. is easy. Absolutely I mean, like not. at all. So, you know, to me, it's just there's. You know, the Japanese believe in the rule of three. And for every three good things, three bad things happen. Right. Oh, geez. But it's just. I was hoping it was one. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's rule three. So, like, you know, you just when when you live your life knowing that nothing is perfect and something is going to happen, you just better prepare yourself to realize that you shouldn't get down on yourself and you shouldn't, like, start to kick rocks and just want to, like, kill yourself over it because it's going to happen. It's just life. And you change and you figure out what you can do better the next time or you change exactly what you're doing. You change it all completely. I think um, honestly, I think that it helps. And I think a lot of big companies now that weren't so big before, it's the ability to pivot and innovate because you don't look at failure as an option. You have to realize that life throws you hurdles and you just got to do better every single time. Well, absolutely. And it's like you said, like, you know, things are changing. Like the market yeah. is changing so fast. So it like is. what worked a year ago exactly is not going to work now. Exactly. And what worked five years ago seems insane exactly. at this point. Five years ago seems, I mean, did we have Uber five years right. ago? You know exactly. what I mean? Like for real. I mean, we did, but you know, we adapt really, really fast to the things that happened to us. But then you look back and you're like, wow, you know, yeah. every, you know, you know, adapt or die, right? Exactly. You know, every company has to adapt to reach their current exactly. audience. You know, we're seeing a lot of that now in the shift of like digital media podcasts, even, exactly. you know, having the opportunity to sit and have a real conversation that's not uncensored, that could be broadcasted freely, you know, the democratization mm -hmm. of, uh, of information and content and stuff. I mean, it's a, it's a whole new world, exactly. you know? So I would, I would talk about this biscuit hustle, man, you know? Those are the best biscuits. Thank you. Oh, my God. <laughs> They're too good. Sometimes I just should strap them onto my stomach directly. I should make a biscuit belt and call it a day. You could. Yeah, I think I did. You Honestly, could. I think it's already there under my shirt right now. But, you know, um, the food is so good. And I definitely appreciate, like, how much you commit to the community. You know, uh, when you had the brick and mortar drive through, you know, um, the one thing that I, I really, really respect about you is that 
you always support the community, but you don't talk about it. You know, you don't feel the need to like pat yourself on the back about it. You're not like getting government help because you're hiring people. You're just doing it. You're just and, and, you know, just little things like leaving, letting your bathroom be open to the public. And I mean, there's just a lot of things about you that I think were defined by your history as a child that really, you know, what I, what I love about you so much is that you're not naive and, and you don't take any shit from anybody thank you but you are a very kind person thank you and thank i you. i think that's a hard balance it can be yeah i th you know i think um you know i was i i grew up in section eight housing until i was 13 years old so i know what it means to struggle and it's not it's not any path anyone actively chooses right right um, but I also remember people like, I mean, even in my family, like my mom's siblings are awful. They just would, you know, they like to brag. They were really into church, brag about going to church, you know, brag about what they put in the pot brag. I'm like, who cares? Like, shouldn't it be good enough that you just went? Shouldn't you just feel good that you just went? Do we have to talk about it? You know what right. I mean? And then what? Is it supposed to guilt me into thinking I should have gone to church and I should have put in the pot? So, you know, like I just, I'm, I'm not into braggadocia. My, my parents aren't either. And I don't, I don't think anything should be taken for granted. So I just don't see why people need to get into that kind of mindset. I mean, you should just do what's right as to your best extent possible. You know, there are people that can't all the time and I get it. Life's tough, but you know, it's not, it's not about pleasing everybody else. It's really just about living your life the cleanest way possible, whatever that means. Right. Um, to me, clean living means being honest with myself. Right. Being a friend to whoever I can be a friend to. Right. You know, and it's, I, you know, I don't even, even I don't even think like about having enemies. Right. People that like, oh, I'm going to talk to them again. Oh, why? Right. Why? Like what wrong has happened that severely that you can't just vibe again? <laughs> right. right? Yeah, you know, great, great uncle. Yeah. Like, I mean, people <laughs> piss you off. Yeah, absolutely. But you just move on. Right. Like just I don't carry grudges. I'm just not that kind of person. Um probably would stop caring before I had right. an active vendetta against somebody. Right. Um, and I think it's just a w healthier way to be. And if you can get your mind in that place and realize that you should just do what's right for everyone all the time to the best extent you can, everyone's happier. Right. You lead a more right. organic lifestyle that way. Um, so I think, I mean, it's not, it's funny. It's, just, it's funny you pick these things up. Cause I just, I don't even think about it. I don't even think about that. I just think it's what you should do. Right. right? Well, and exactly. Cause some things just, you know, it's just how we're programmed, right? But right. not everybody is programmed that way. It's right, yeah. You know, I can see it like when I uh, went into the Mason Dixie on Seventh Street. You know, when you first opened, and and they didn't know who I was. Yeah, they didn't know that I was friends with you, and um, everybody in there was so nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little white lady working in there too. Yeah. I was like, where'd she come from? She was so awesome. I'm like, who's aunt, auntie or grandma? <laughs> right. Are you, you know? <laughs> Um, but everybody was so sweet and so attentive and I knew it wasn't because I was friends with the owner. No. I wasn't, I, they'd never seen me before. Nothing. They were super helpful. You know, I mean, just, and you, you could just tell like there's love there, yeah. you know, you could tell. And I, I mean, know that really makes me proud. I mean, that's what, yeah. that's what it's all about. I mean, I always tell them like every day, if you can make one more person smile, you've made it like yeah. how, what bigger reward is there than having someone else be happy because of you? And it took nothing. It could have, it took, you know, it could take remembering to give him a straw. Like it really, you don't believe the little moments that you can influence in someone's life every freaking day. hundred percent. And, but how sad is it though, that standard nice service is a luxury that you had to call out. Like to me, that's, that's an abomination. Like it's, to me, that's a, that is, that is surface level standard. Like you shouldn't be operating unless you're operating that way. So and it's funny that you have to train people to get there because they're so used to like hustle, bustle, move them in, move them out. Right. And not cattle. I mean, these are people, right? Like totally. they're coming and they're spending money at your establishment. You should vibe with them. Have a good time. Yeah. Smile, like make their day. Right. Yeah. And I think um, it's 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 you have to retrain people nowadays to think that way, which is kind of sad. Um, but you know, my staff does a, a killer job. They made me proud every day. They're good, man. They're great. And, they're good. and now that they know I'm your friend, I still am not getting any free biscuits. <laughs> I'm just Gen saying general policy. That no. means they're doing their job. But no, it's great. <laughs> well, no, exactly. Cause like you've trained them to be like warm and friendly and but it's great, more about great being proud of what they have. Right. If you start right. to discount what you have, exactly. That's when things start to shift. Right. And you know, one thing that we talk about a lot, which, um, I never thought would be something I'd have to talk about, but you know, 
I employ basically 100% minority staff, no matter what that category is. Right. And one of the things we always talk about is not being of, of people that don't have the luxury of knowing better, which sucks. Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the first things we did when we learned about the menu together was telling people like about chicken, for example, the chicken industry is horrifying. Right. Mm. We use cage free, antibiotic free, hormone free birds. Right. Same thing with the eggs. We don't use preservatives. All of our ingredients are simple um, with traceable origin. Right. And explaining to even my staff the importance of what they're putting in their body and the decisions that they make when they buy things. Mm -hmm. They've all changed. Right. And they've taught their families right. and they've taught their friends and they know, you know, it's okay to eat fried chicken. It's definitely okay. To eat. Everybody loves fried chicken. Right. Hell yeah. But you can, you cannot eat the nasty stuff that KFC is serving that right. might make your tits bigger in a year. Right. Like there's so <laughs> Wait, much. Wait, hold on. What? Right? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you do want to. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like it's the, there's so much hormone. There's so much artificial. There's so much bad stuff. And I think brown folks are conditioned to think that that's okay. And that's normal. And I'm telling you, that's not. And you shouldn't. And you shouldn't have to accept that stance in society because you were taught you don't deserve better. Um, and that's when that was pivotal. Like, I, I think if anything, if they stay with me or not, I just hope they walk away knowing a little bit more about what they deserve in life and to work harder to get that. Because I did, too. I mean, like I like I said, I, I grew up that way as well. But I knew my family knew what quality was. It was always very important, you know, quality over quantity any day of the week um, because it's important to know the origin of everything, mm -hmm. right? So that's another thing that I think is really important that gets lost in translation with, you know, growth and companies that are trying to do better, right? They get so lost in the messaging to the consumer, they forget that the first person who should know is their staff. Right. And they need to believe it and right. know the importance of it. Right. Right? So... I think that's another thing that helps build the culture in our company too, right? It's just that uh, that they have a value, and even if it's not at the at work, it's a value at home, right? right? Um, financial literacy. Yeah. I make sure every staff member that we have. I mean, m a lot of them don't even know they qualify for a bank account, right? Right. Like basic level financial planning, things like that, are just those are very important things to learn. And I was blessed to have parents that emphasize that nonstop. I think my mom gave me one of her like deposit book things when I was like five. <laughs> that was like the first math exercise, right? She'd like slap my hand if I got an eight. You know, I'd write a figure eight weird. But like that, that whole practice was very, very important. Finance is very, very important. So sure. that was another thing that we've always worked on. And I realized it's something we have to work on as an industry to do better For is sure. getting people more financially literate. So, you know, and I, I think that I think one of the biggest takeaways you know like when you when you open up the first brick and mortar and i mean well one of the highlights of my career was when you asked me to come package some biscuits so i had this like laverne <laughs> and shirley like <laughs> fantasy in my head where i was going to be at the biscuit factory and it was pretty awesome i'm not gonna lie <laughs> but what i what i really respect about you is that like you know opening day and not just opening day but every day like you're behind the fucking register like, mm -hmm. you come into the grand opening of your new restaurant, and you are behind the register. Yeah. You come into the grand opening of the 7th Street location, and you are behind the register. You are slinging biscuits. You are moving. There's not even enough time for me to, you know, congratulate you and hype you up. You know what I mean? Because you're too busy working. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, that says a lot about, you know, like, how, how people lead, right? You yeah. know, are you at the are you at the front, you know what I mean? Like, leading the charge, or are you in the back, you know, telling everybody else what to do? Right. And, I mean, it's just so impressive, and I think that that probably really imprints on your staff as well, that, like, hey, you know, and especially in the beginning, because, you know, you still had a full-time job. Right. Which blows my mind. I mean, to really just, like, think about the fact that, like, you launched this company and within two years, we're in a thousand stores. Yep. Not even Not two even years. Not even two years, about a year, yeah. I don't know. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like, while working a full-time job, yeah. like, talk about no excuses, right? Talk about, like, setting your eyes on the prize and, like, relentlessly but going like, for that. But you got to think why, right? Like, I had to because every dollar that was made was made to funnel into the operational people that mattered more than anything, right? Like to actually be able to build the business, whether it be a biscuit packer, a baker, 
whatever it was, those basic elements were way, way more important than me being able to get paid. At the end of the day, it's my business. I have to make it work, right? People are dependent on you to make it work. And so I had to. I had to work. And I had to figure out a way to finance this whole thing. I mean, we were bootstrapped until last year. So, so that, that brings me to my next question. You know, um, you know, from reading your bio, people would think like you just selling biscuits left and right and it was all smooth right, sailing. Yeah. But it certainly wasn't the case. There was, you know, no. commercial funding, industrial space. There was, you know, br- two different brick and mortars. Um, you know, you moved your business in the Northeast and so you got a whole lot of y'all should, oh, yeah. you know, y'all should. Well, anytime you're a business owner, people want to tell oh, yeah. you what to do. <laughs> I, I used to do it, too, until I became a business owner. And I was like, oh, <laughs> my God. I meant well, but I will never, ever say you should again. Like, right, yeah. I just had some great ideas, but like nobody right. wants to hear them right now. Right. But like, you know, how did you get through some of those struggles? Because, you know, I feel like, you know, I have a little insider advantage from knowing you, but like you are a lone wolf. Now, Ross, you know, is the shit, right? Yeah. And Ross is your business partner. And with, without Ross, like the company would not exist. Absolutely. But I also know like how much stress that you take on that you don't even like put on the backs of your partner, you know, or right. staff or whatever. So how have you like dealt with the stress of all that? You know, how have you managed and balanced like health, self-care? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I think um, one one thing is I don't see this as work, right? I do see this as a part of my life, just like any other component is. Um, it is a struggle a lot of the times. It's a struggle to balance friends, business, you know, self care, all that stuff is it is a challenge and there are times where you have to prioritize. Yeah. Um, but I think keeping organized, prioritizing things that have to take precedent over other things, um, but also making an active effort, even if it's only an hour in a week, like you have to make the time to see friends and to see family and to you know, go on a walk, do that kind of thing. I think we're kind of blessed now to especially be in a city where like, you know, fitness is monetized. So like investing in the time pushes you into that thing. So right. like taking these classes, you're like thirty five dollars, like damn I you know, now I can't afford I not to go. It. Right. Yeah, like exactly. so so that kind of thing is I think super helpful. It doesn't help that, you know, solid core is right next door to us. So like, you know, you it, it's a good impulse builder. But right. I think um like I said, if you think that your business is part of your life, I think you make a better effort of realizing that it's not a punch in, punch out kind of kind of thing. No. Right? Like you sleep, think about business. Um, it, it's funny because like even like Ross has said, like, I don't know how you do this every day because it's like balancing the restaurant and then balancing the CPG brand. It's a lot. But you just have to, I don't know, like maybe I'm just programmed very strangely, but I just I just switch. I'll just switch whenever I need to because it's. It's more entertaining to do that. I can't imagine doing a job where it was monotonous and I'm pressing the same damn button right. every hour. I just, I can't imagine being that person. And I think that's because there's so much dynamics happening every day for me that it's easy for me to feel like I'm accomplishing. And that's another thing actually is um, always feeling like you're accomplishing something every day. I actually block out time in my calendar to make sure that it's something to accomplish not just a meeting, right. right? So even if it's a meeting, meeting Molly, the accomplishment is do my first podcast. Hey. You know, like you know, then then you feel good about okay, I didn't sacrifice that hour. I could have been at happy hour. I could have been doing one more thing at the office. I actually accomplished something I've never done right now. Right. So if you took every task you do in a day and stop turning it into a chore and a must and right. turn it into a learning experience. You really start to shift how you think about time and time spent, right? A hundred percent. You know, um, I, I recently um, got a new little book to put all my notes in. I went and bought like gel pens, my like pink and purple because <laughs> I like really want to spice up my note taking. But it makes it more fun, you yeah, know? Yeah. And I'm not writing to-do lists. I'm writing daily goals. <laughs> I'm writing weekly goals, right? Exactly. They're goals, man. It's not to do. It's exactly. like just reshaping the the lens and like how I see things and how I perceive things. Is it going to be a chore yep. or is it going to be a goal? Exactly. Right. Like it's a lot easier to like, it feels better to accomplish goals exactly. than to check off chores. Exactly. You know? So, you know, I, I know a lot of, um, I, I was looking through the 
Washington Business Journal. Oh, by the way, Washington Business Journal, uh, top people to watch 2017. That's right. And 18 (laughs) and 19 and 20, if you ask me. Just saying. But, you know, I was doing a lot of research uh, recently, you know, because I want to reach out to different people to interview them. Yeah. And so I started going through some of those uh, business journal to do or, or the top list. I used to work for the business journal. So it was like, oh, wow. Visiting I didn't all, know yeah. that. I, I've had a lot Look of jobs, you. man. You know, circulation <laughs> sales. Would you like to update your subscription? Um, it's that was auto. That was my first dive into uh, the corporate world. And that was the awful. last dive into the corporate world for me. But um you know, uh, I was l- looking at these lists of people and I started you know, writing down names of people and their titles, people who I like resonated with me a little bit. And then I started noticing there's a lot of women. So I, I was like, oh, yeah, I want to I want to interview her. I want to interview her. And then I couldn't help but notice that, like, you know, under every person's name and title, there's like a little, you know, par- paragraph, two sentences, three sentences. And the way that the women were described and their accomplishments completely different than how the men are described i mean it it was couldn't be any more obvious and we tend to be like you know first black woman to run a university like why you know what i mean like oh, like yes that has value to it but like stop defining us by right. our race and exactly. our gender exactly and then even it's like describing women they're like oh well after losing a 20 million dollar you know she battled her way back mm-hmm. they would never point out a man's you know failure it's, in the it's description like- on the Right. You know, top like it's, what? It's glass ceiling versus glass floor, right? For men, there's a glass ceiling. For women, there's a glass floor. It's every opportunity for her to fail and come out of it. It's interesting you bring it up because fundraising is one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I went to this um, pretty cool women in venture um, program seminar in Richmond, Virginia. And one of the women that was leading this discussion had said a very interesting t- statistic for me, and it resonated 100,000%, and it's doing exactly what you're saying. She said that um, on trend, 90% of the time, when a startup CEO founder is interviewed and they happen to be a man, uh, the, the interview questions tend to be, what will you do with all of your success? What happens if it's too successful, right? When it's a woman, it's the complete opposite is what are you going to do if it starts to tank? How will you come out of a dark spell? Are you equipped for failure? And it's like, okay, why she got to fail? Right. But he don't like, you know what I mean? Like in a lot of the times too, it's like guys make so much more money with unfounded results. Women mm. um, constantly walk into a room over prepared. We always have foundational proof of success walking in. Men rarely do. And yet they make more, they get more investment money than women. So let me ask you, so do you think that, you know, cause, and I know a lot of times people talk about like, Oh, like tell us about your struggles as a woman. And it's like, I don't know, man, I kind of, you know, it kind of goes back to that point. It's like, you know, yes, they exist, right? And like right. Fast Company just put out an article about like the top, you know, twelve CEOs to watch, and there's like two yeah. women on it, you know, mm-hmm. or fifteen. There's two women on it, and they got a bunch of heat for it. And then they did another article, and it was like, you know, people who have overcome obstacles, and it was like ten women and two men, and it was like, are you kidding me, right? So it's like I, I hate the idea of like focusing on like how it was harder for women. So I want to ask you like. You know, first of all, how did being a woman benefit you over mm-hmm. the last few years? Mm-hmm. And then how do you like, you know, how do you how do you pivot from those things? Or do you just tune tune it out? Do you just not give a fuck? I, you know, it's a double edged sword, right? You, as a woman, you have to every moment that someone recognizes female accomplishment is an accomplishment for us in right. general and for humanity in general. For sure. Um, but I agree with you a thousand percent. I hate being i mean not not just as a woman and also a minority woman right being put in these artificial blobs as if we're subhuman or a different category of human why can't i just be awesome for being awesome right right? why can't that list stop doing the quota thing and just cite awesome people right and do a better job researching i mean that's the that's the problem really right like i feel like um there aren't a lot of mollies out in the world i know they need to hire me to write they do well no they need people that are gonna go out and like Think about why people are awesome right. and what is important to take away from that. It's not just about heroism and bringing up revenue and like right. innovating crap. It's heroism in any way possible. If it's 
you know, coming up with a new way to do things. It doesn't have to be the CEO. It could have been some woman that's in a lab somewhere and she like right. found a new formula to do something. Why can't you just talk about generally awesome things, right? Mm -hmm. But it's 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 people just being generally ignorant and just not thinking through what it means to be amazing and what resonates with the average person. Half of those times when I read those lists, I'm like, I don't even actually think, God, I wish I was that person, man, woman, both, whatever. Right. I literally can't even can't even relate. And then I go, Why was this person picked? Like right. I just I don't even know what they did. Right. Right. I'm like, they work for a Fortune 500 company. Is that what made them awesome? Right. Because that Fortune 500 company been there. Right. Like you and, took over a portfolio. And then every time you say this is the first woman to do anything, it's a complete disrespect to like all the other women well, who already did it. Correct. And they just didn't get like, there's, yeah. there's no woman doing the first anything right now. A hundred percent at all. hundred percent. Anywhere. Except for maybe going to the fucking moon. That's like the only thing that's left out. Right. You right. know what I mean? Exactly. A woman has done all of that before. Exactly. In fact, the first, the first millionaire in the United States was a black woman mm -hmm. and not just the first woman millionaire or the first black millionaire, but the first millionaire on record yep. madam cj walker that's right you know um and so yeah and so yeah you do a huge disservice to not only women but the minority women right. who have done that before and provided opportunities it, for us to exactly and it's funny because i i i love and i hate uh female empowerment groups because while i do feel like it's an important thing because we need a sense of community mm -hmm. i sometimes believe that that sense of community is built on an artificial presence that you need the negativity in order to thrive you need mm. men discluding you in order to have that sense of community which is a double-edged sword and it's dumb i just think it's dumb there's i hate women only things i think I, I said this um at a at a conference i was at actually and I had like three people clap because they were too scared to say anything. And then like <laughs> 30 people emailed me after. They were like, I'm so glad you said it because I was right. I was at this chat. It was a women panel um, about food women. Right. And all the panelists and the moderator were women. And it was marketed in the brochure to only women. It said female attendees only. Right. And I was like. What? <laughs> I, and I, that's what I stood up and I was like, you know, this is all awesome, but you, we're all speaking to ourselves here. Right. What you know, it'd be doing? really awesome is if you had all the dudes in here listening to we what we're to saying. Actually right. Hear it. Exactly. Yeah. Like, we that's don't what I'm saying. Ourselves. Like, you constantly, you can't say it's empowerment if you're living on the false platform that men are keeping you down. Right. Mm. That, that doesn't work. It's not doing any help. Right. Right. It's like, it's accepting segregation, really. Um, it really is. It is. You know, I, I would talk about this a lot with One Love Massive because, like, people would book a DJ lineup and it'd be all women and they'd make a big deal about that. I'd be like, you would never say an all Jewish DJ lineup. Correct. Exactly. You would never say an all black DJ lineup. Exactly. So, why is it okay to say an all women's lineup? And, like, can we just celebrate women without talking about it? Without exactly. making, you know, patting ourselves on the back for it. 100%. So I have to say, I definitely respect that, you know, I don't know if the biscuit industry <laughs> is a male dominated industry. No, it is. I mean, food is. I mean, I will say being a woman-owned business has not has been very helpful in this industry. Um, sadly, it is such a minority that you have to call it out, and calling it out helps because mm -hmm. they're like, oh, you know, even if they have quotas or whatever, it, they realize they do need to do a better job, but it's such an antiquated industry. They have no idea where to start, right? Right. So at least qualifying and knowing that that business is woman-owned, women-led is a very important first step for them, Right. And I think they're doing more and more of it and beyond just women. It's also international, like acknowledging that Latin foods is becoming one of the biggest trends in America right now. Um, the industry's doing that. They know it. And that's pretty awesome. Right. Um, you know, they're carving actual space in the grocery store right. to ensure that they have the space. Represent the right. Yeah, absolutely. So like from that standpoint, like being a woman has been awesome because it's gotten our foot in the door at times where we might have just blended into the crowd. I'm not making like kale bread right like i'm right. not innovating some crazy stuff right I mean, I, biscuits are like the oldest food on the in the how, country <laughs> that, and how crazy that the innovation for me is that i'm actually making it the way it's supposed to be made right with <laughs> five well, ingredients like, how many exactly. ingredients are in the, the base recipe has seven ingredients right. but it's everything everyone has in their pantry like if they just knew how to make our biscuits they could literally it's like nothing crazy secret. If, if i knew how to make your biscuits i'd be 400 pounds well right i mean now. it's all it, the biggest thing was time saving right like we I wanted to craft this whole line surrounding the fact that nobody has time anymore to really spend time on making 
food correctly. Rising the bread right, yeah. or, just, you know, all just that Just the hand-making yeah. and prep. I mean, that's why yeah. there's all those HelloFresh, those meal kits. It's the prep time that everyone wants to cut out. Everyone wants to just get to the to the cooking and eating part, right? And understandably so. We're all busy people. But it doesn't mean we should sacrifice quality. It shouldn't mean that we should sacrifice the root of what something is. Um, comfort food, southern food, is the only true farm-to-table cuisine that we have in, in America. It's the right. only American cuisine. And the root of it literally was farm-to-table. It was that slaves picked the things out of the field and cooked it at the table. That is the origin of that food. Right. Whether it be a yard bird or collard greens. I mean, they came out of the same land. And that is what survived the American identity for so long. And people don't even know that. It, somehow, a biscuit that was made out of seven, five to seven ingredients, handmade by somebody, became something made out of uh, polyunsaturated soybean, hydrogenated this. Like, words I don't even know what they are. I had to Google them to figure out that they were additives to make fake milk you know what i mean like why how did we get there how did we get there from from right. pick it out the yard and put it in a pan to it's fake like it's horrifying well and especially you look right now how there's like this world uh, record-breaking surplus of government cheese oh. because they had a abundance of milk because they've been overproducing milk mm -hmm. and then the this whole almond milk uh you know, cashew milk has tanked the dairy industry yeah. and so then they started turning all the milk into cheese and now they have enough cheese to like go around the planet three times and yeah. no one's buying it no because nobody buying. wants your shitty american cheese exactly. they want gouda they want exactly. some humble fog you know whatever whatever right and exactly. so um, but it's so crazy because here we are talking about how the industry shifted away from using real ingredients and now they're literally like stockpiling in warehouses those same ingredients that they abandoned using mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to make money right mm -hmm. like it all boils down to make making money it does oh man well so let me ask you something like when you have found yourself in these i mean you know with with your background and your studies and all the things that you knew none of them had shit to do with finding a place for 40 pallets of frozen biscuits. <laughs> yeah. You know, none of them had anything to do with signing leases, yeah. you know, commercial leases, um, looking at, you know, it, uh, industrial properties and industrial financing and things like that, you know, like, you know, co commercial and industrial, like all these things, right? Like that is not something that you had any background in. So like, how did you navigate your way through that? Like, was that something that you leaned on your partners for? Was that something you lean on your parents? Do you have other mentors? Do you have really great attorneys? Like, where did no. you find that balance to answer those questions? I think you have to be a naturally curious person to be an entrepreneur. And you have to be a nice person who can help leverage the relationships you have to help find people that want to help you. Right. And I've been incredibly blessed and lucky to constantly meet amazing people in fields that I never would have interacted with, right? I, you know, if I didn't know how to design something, I lean on a great architect friend who would tell me how to do it and lead the way and make so many personal sacrifices to help me. You know, it, it'd be Googling around and finding the one guy who is one of the youngest people who's created a Hershey automation plant, right? It's like you, you find these people that have these amazing stories, the ones that are not told in all these lists of amazing people. Right. And they're out there and they want to be a part of something. And, you know, to them, it's like if they if they were a part of something from the ground level, even if it was just answering one question, there's not there's countless times where I've asked one question and those people have been uh, game changers for me. You're one of them. Oh, I mean, thanks. like like you, you don't know what you don't know, but you have to admit that first. Right. And then you have to ask as many people as you can and do the research to figure out who knows it and start the conversation. And somehow, some way, someone will help you. There are generally good people out there. And if you just work to find them, they will be there for you. And and hopefully you can reciprocate, right? Like it's not just about giving free biscuits after that. Like I hope to reward those people with other additional business or contacts right. or whatever you'll need. I, I'll be there. Whatever. Right. Want me to attend it? I'll be there. Right? right. So it's it's paying it forward any way you can and just really trying to be resourceful and asking all the right questions and admitting when you just don't know anything. Yeah. And it's okay. Right. That's another. I feel like we're in a type A city. People hate not admitting what they don't know. And I don't know why, because it's it's an amazing thing not to be perfect because somebody out there fits in the puzzle of your life. If you can 
give them that opportunity. If you sit here thinking you know everything, no one needs to enter into this bubble. Right, exactly. Walk around lonely. Man, that's really great. Uh, that's really great knowledge and information and insight, you know, for sure. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate your, you know, just never ending, like, you know, eye on the prize, you know, you never, yeah. uh, you never stop, you know, relentless, you know, um, gotta be. So let me ask you, uh, what's next? You know, what's next? Are oh. you, is Mason Dixie, uh, a, a international brand? I mean, where, where, you know, what, I'd love that. <laughs> what is your, you know, do you have a trajectory where you'd like to be in five, 10 years? Yeah. I mean, I mean, we definitely want to be more than just biscuits. Um, we were, we've been an interesting brand because we've done this thing where we contend with big people and the big people are like megaliths for kind of no reason but just time right so like, people are used to the brand. yeah right like okay we make fried chicken oh my competition's kfc popeyes like big guys okay then it's we make biscuits we sell them in the grocery store my competition's pillsbury Ooh. right so the next big thing for me i mean we have this awesome restaurant we make awesome breakfast yes, i'm looking do. in that freezer and i'm seeing jimmy dean jimmy dean jimmy dean and i'm like oh god what's in that sausage you know, like Facts. what's in that biscuit, right? Like it, there's there's now time and the ability to create a better breakfast sandwich, a better biscuit sandwich, nitrate free sausage, cage free eggs, the whole nine. Yeah. Um, and bring it to a portable family that wants the utility of being able to throw it in the microwave. Right. So that's the next chapter. We want to expand into, you know, frozen food in general and finding those mega lists that are doing things wrong because they own the space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you go into like the breakfast cell and it's a sea of yellow. It's just Kellogg's, right? right. That should change. There's no reason. You right. mean you tell me your mom may make a bomb waffle, right? Right. Like anyone can make a bomb waffle. Like why can't we do those things? Why right. are we accepting this? Right. So those are the next steps. I think we want to shift breakfast. I think we want to shift what it means to be convenient, right? Like people are buying our biscuits right now and they think it's convenient because it's cutting out an hour's worth of prep time, even though it takes 30 minutes to make it. People will wait for good food. Yeah. And what I can say about those biscuits is they are, they're the same. Like they're literally the same biscuits in case you guys are wondering. It's yeah. literally the, the exact same biscuits. Some go in the oven and some go in the packaging. Exactly. It's the exact same product. Yep. And so if you buy them joints and you bring them home, it tastes just as good. And if you cook them properly, they taste just as good. Exactly. We didn't pull the whole Olive Garden switcheroo on you with the cracked <laughs> dressing, right? Like, right. It's, no, our dressing's the same dressing, right? Like, if you're going to the restaurant, you're getting the same biscuit. And that was really important to us because we see the restaurant as a marketing piece for us, uh, a little bit of a test kitchen. Hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll be releasing some test kitchen events with um, people in the community to come try out some of the things we're working on. Uh, uh, you know, I'll be there, girl. Uh, you'll be on the invite list. Hey. <laughs> hey. So, um, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's it helps us innovate practically. Right. And it helps us stay true to our brand values. If we're not if we're taking shortcuts, what's to stop me from doing it in the frozen section right. and just becoming another yellow box? Right. Another General Mills. Right nothing so you have to stay true and you have to let people hold you accountable for it and our customers hold us accountable every day yeah they right? sure do and man. they should if something's yeah. wrong you should let us know right yeah. like we want to know right um maybe do it in a dm though and not like on the public comments you know but heathens, hey, you, you know, know like <laughs> you know people like a forum you know it's fine yeah you know yeah, it's yeah. just it is what it is but you know like you're a better man than i am <laughs> let me tell you <laughs> well i appreciate you for being a soldier no matter what though i mean you need you need those people to, to clap back sometimes <laughs> people just like attention too so you have to you know, you gotta, you gotta hush them up sometimes, but you know, I think sometimes silence is critical, especially for a brand, right? You gotta be careful to get too passionate about something. Cause at the end of the day, one opinion doesn't mean that it's the opinion of everybody. And they don't know shit. They don't know yeah. the hours you put in or if yeah, your family the member thing. died or right. what, so you know, you're going to go or, you know, like right. they don't know all but that. But am I going to go into this whole diatribe to explain that? Then it just sounds like I'm making excuses, right? It's like, it's going back to what you said, like you know, not being cocky and not talking about it. Yeah. Right. Cause you don't need to, at the end of the day, proof is in the pudding. If 100%. you it, proof is in the biscuit, right? If you like that biscuit, you'll come back. <laughs> the for it. butter is in the don't. biscuit. That's what yeah, definitely some butter. In there. Man. I, when I came to the seven street location, the current restaurant, and I looked up on the ceiling and I saw that <laughs> <laughs> that butter mural. It was not a mural. It's just like just butter word. and like stylized text, but it just says <laughs> like in like five foot letters, butter on the ceiling. And I fucking laughed so hard. I'm like, 
fuck yeah, butter. You know what I mean? Like butter makes everything better except for your waistline. But man, there's so much butter in those biscuits, girl. But that's why it's good. I mean, that's how it's supposed to be made. Like it's actually the secret ingredient to all of it. Butter. You know, it is. I mean, that, literally, the the thing that makes us different in the market today is that we are the literally, literally only manufacturer of biscuits using real dairy, real butter. Which is so crazy. Even Annie's Organic uses palm oil as the replacement for the fat. Annie's Organic. Like, you, you do have the word organic in your name. Right. Palm oil kills pandas. Well, that's not cool. I love pandas. <laughs> I, that's, I'm know? just saying we're in D.C. Don't eat those biscuits. I'm just saying, like, that's that's the state of reality. I mean, that is what's happening to food. People mm-hmm. see the word organic, and they think it's better for them. People right. see the word non-GMO, and I'm like, do you even know? Maybe it was non-GMO from birth. I mean, maybe there was just no way to manipulate that thing, right? Exactly. So, you know, just it, it has to do with just pure consciousness and just thinking about don't bleach something. Yeah. Don't don't add some word that sounds like a chemical you're not familiar with. Right. You know, like just know know what you're supposed to be putting in your body. If you made it from scratch, know how it should have been made from scratch. Know what's in scratch. For sure. How, how do you define scratch? Right. People right. really need to start thinking about that. Um, again, it goes back to those life lessons that we really emphasize at the restaurant. Right. Everything is full circle. You know, and it's funny because I, I went to uh, Italy for Thanksgiving. Oh, my God. And uh, all I did was eat pasta, and oh. drink wine. It was a meat and like meat, lots of meat, you know. Oh. But I noticed there's no fat Italians, you no. know, and all they do is eat bread, cheese, ham. Yep. And pasta. Yep. And there's no fat Italians. And so, yeah, I am about that life. I think, you know, really simplifying your diet and living to the fullest. Exactly. And yeah, you can eat biscuits and you can eat pasta exactly. and you can still be you healthy. You can do all that. Just don't eat it with all the crap with in it, right? all the bleached flour exactly. and all the Exactly. Lead a balanced lifestyle, right? Like, be active. Eat biscuits. That's why I ride my bike to the yeah. biscuit store because I, I mean, feel every- like it balances out oh, a little man. bit. Every Saturday, Sunday morning, it's all runners in there at 8 a.m., right? <laughs> like, they all went on this massive run somewhere amazing in the city, and they come through, and they get a biscuit sandwich, and no one is judging, right? Like, right. Like, that's that's what it's about. It's just, you know, how do you – how to go, like, you asked about balance and how do you do all this stuff when you – Right. It is about balance. you got to figure out what is important in your life, how to keep all those things in, in flux. Otherwise, artificial temporary things that you shift will only ever work temporarily. Yeah. Right? Like – it's it's funny. Somebody asked us if we're ever gonna make a cauliflower, uh, cauliflower flour biscuit, and I said absolutely not, <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. What do you think this is? Right. I'm like, okay. The whole premise of keeping it simple. Do you know what it takes to make f- cauliflower glutinous? Fifty other ingredients you don't know how to pronounce. Right. So the point of putting the cauliflower in it was what? Right. Right. I mean, it, it's that whole shift that if something one thing is healthy, everything is healthy. Nah, it's still got some weird stuff in there. How do you make dough out of something that's a plant? Like it's like it isn't cauliflower like a fungus. Actually, isn't broccoli a fungus? Well, I don't even know. I think so. It probably is. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. like it just it looks doesn't like make a fungus. sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, how are you pulling those proteins out to act like flour? You just it just doesn't make sense. So for science, us, it's just, man, yeah, it's, science. I, I literally got off the phone before I got here and um, we were talking to this company we we're trying to do some stuff with and literally he suggested that we put um, something vegan on our menu, a vegan meat substitute. And I said, I just got done telling you the whole premise of our brand is simplicity and natural and real ingredients. And you just told me to make something unnatural taste like something it's not supposed to be for people that don't even want to eat that thing. It's not to what? Right. I was just like, what? I mean, that's that. That's the thing we have to stop doing. And I will put my foot down every single time, no matter how many times people tell me, oh, it would be a good idea. Oh, you'd make a lot of money. Oh, you're not. You're ignoring a whole population of people. I'm like, you're not supposed to feed everybody. You're not exactly you're not Jesus Christ himself. Right? Exactly. You know, there's no 40 loaves stick, and 40 fishes. In this exactly. Story. I'm going to stick to what I know and what I like. And that's that. I'm going to do those as best as I can. Well, you've been doing a great job of it so far. That's Thank for you. sure. I appreciate it. So tell us, Asha, where can people find your biscuits? Oh, man. So locally in the D.C. area, we're at Whole Foods. All the giants in the area have it. Harris Teeter, Mom's Organic. Yeah. Um, so a lot of great places in between. And then 
nationally we're anywhere from Kroger to Publix to Safeway in Northern California, Sprouts nationally, um, and Lowe's in Florida. So we're, we're in a ton of stores. If you just go on our website, um, hit store locator, you put a zip code in and figure out the closest place for you. And the website is? MasonDixieBiscuits.com. That's pretty simple to remember. It is. All right, and so I have one final question okay. for you, <laughs> um, and I'm kind of stealing this from my favorite podcaster, but it's super relevant. But what is the impact that you want to have on the world? Oh, man. Just one? I mean, <laughs> we'll start with one, right? I think if I can convince people that they deserve better, that's something big because you never know how that's going to manifest itself in other things, right? Abs- a happy People will make a happy planet. That's exactly right. So even if it's a biscuit lover buying a better biscuit, they did one better thing for themselves. They didn't pick something in a blue bag with 17 other ingredients in it, even though they're going to have their biscuit, right? I get all these really eat, like amazing anecdotes. We have a, an amazing fan the other day on Instagram post that um, our biscuits reminded her of her grandmother's recipe. She, she passed away a couple years Aww. ago, and she didn't write anything down. Uh, and this is the closest thing that she could have to it. So she went and back and bought seven more boxes. <laughs> and that is my girl. I mean, I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. what I'm saying. Just like, wow, like, wow, it's just biscuits. Right. But it's not. But it's not that it's smell not. filling the home and, the, exactly. you know, warmth in her hands. And exactly. All exactly. Her of her exactly. So that that's the that's why you do everything every day. Right. People. People think, oh, I work in a government job. I can't impact people. Oh, I'm just a trash, you know, garbage man. And I don't, everybody in this ecosystem makes a it place all, in the sun. It all yeah. matters. Exactly. Absolutely. It all matters. Well, Asha, I can't, I can't thank you enough for being here. I think, you. Um, you know, I love you so much and uh, we don't, here, we don't dear. get to hang out enough. So I this know. is like a, a quasi hang and quasi business, but um, I'm stoked. This is your first podcast. Oh, was, this was amazing. I'm so proud of you, Molly. Thank Honestly. you. Like this is just exactly what the universe wanted for you. I, I love thank it. you. I, you know, I think that too. And so thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, love it. I feel like I'm in a, in a good place. And I'm excited to be able to have these types of conversations. Cause I think that, you know, right now we're in a very tumultuous place. It's a very confusing time. The economy is about to, you know, turn to shit sooner than later. Um, a lot of people, you know, little, I mean, you're a little younger than me, but you know, I lived through a recession. All you right. lived through a recession. There's a lot of yeah. people out here in the workforce who have never, they yep. were in elementary school when the recession hit, so they have absolutely no idea. It's a good time to pivot, isn't it? It is. It is. And, you know, like Gary Vee says, you know, like, uh, you're you're ready. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're ready. You guys don't even know what's ahead of you, you know? Exactly. And that's an advantage that people who are a little bit older have. And I just think that it's so important. I, I am definitely somebody who leads by example, or I try to be. Yep. Um, and I try not to get caught up too much in the, the conversations uh, about shit that I don't like and just really focus on how I like to do things. Exactly. And that's what got me started with One Love Massive and Hardcast and just wanting to provide that opportunity. So I um I, I appreciate you as a as a person, as a Same human, girl. as a I'm glad friend. you're a part of this universe. Uh, right back at you, man. And, and keep crushing because you're absolutely an inspiration to Thank not just you. me but i'm sure lots of people that you come in contact with and um, you are truly all. making seventh street shawsome and you can, <laughs> you can totally like punch me in my face later for saying that but uh nothing but love for you Definitely thank mama. you so much thank you uh, for having me this is great awesome man and uh for those of you tuning in uh thank you so much for tuning in to the lower third podcast uh this is where we dig deep with the relentless and unstoppable just like asha here uh, if you liked what you heard today, if you want me to keep interviewing some amazing people like this, please uh, like, comment, share, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, hit us up on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you can find us, man, we'll be there. And I'm going to continue to have great conversations with people to find out, you know, what is that? What gets you out of bed in the morning and what makes you that superstar? So inspiring. Thank you so much, and uh, and until next time, we'll uh, let's go get some biscuits. Let's do it.